Hmm. Here we are. <laughs> we made it to this point. <laughs> Yay. Hmm. Well, we I'm hope you hope you're all well and um, take the time to see everyone on the other pages if you want. It's good to do. actually wonderful to do. I hope everybody is doing well. And those of you who have just come off of a retreat with us, we hope you're integrating well as best you can. We're happy to get back again on this our regular Sunday sitting schedule as well. Yeah. Good to see everybody. Hey. <laughs> More and more, I think it's important to um, receive the goodness of uh, being together and sitting together, just that simplicity of that goodness. And um, that itself can be a doorway into more kindness, care, empathetic joy, and acceptance of things as they are. So when we begin, it's often helpful to notice your posture. And no matter what your posture is to just let your attention settle in within your skin or the space around your skin. And, and just notice as you let the attention sink in more deeply, if your posture itself has a balance of a certain ease and relaxation and uprightness or alertness. And often it's helpful to check to see if our attention has access to a more open field of attention that includes hearing itself. Often we Not everyone, but often we can just check to see if the attention is able to receive whatever sounds or silence, the textures of the silence, the textures of the vibrations and textures of sound. If we can at times receive them directly through the ear door, 
not just through the thought process. So it's one place we can notice that we can gradually shift more out of the thoughts about what's happening. Thoughts about a sound to, again, at times just receiving textures and vibrations as close as we can to just as they're happening. And at times noticing them disappear. So we are starting to understand that ease of well-being that comes from a less sticky attention, just letting the sounds come and go just as they are without having to fix or change or manipulate them. So we shift into a quality of awareness of what's happening, but less need to do anything with what's happening. And that kind of sets the stage for that kind of relationship with whatever appears moment by moment. And so often getting that sense of a larger field of awareness to shifting into our hands, a much smaller field of awareness. Where we practice the sense of noticing the visual memory of our our word hands to our moment to moment direct experience of the sensations there coming and going, always new, always different. So again, we check to see, can we receive these experiences of sensations directly. And of course, thoughts will come and go. Memory of visual image, but you just notice them come and go in the present moment. No struggle. And just land. Land there again. With this relationship of connection without controlling.
just letting what's appearing be just as it is. With our breath at the abdomen, deeper inside our body, accepting that, of course, a visual image will come and go. And it's just making space for. not the thoughts about the experience. But this exquisite unfolding of life itself alive, moment by moment. And notice if you can receive that movement. If you notice any controlling happen, you just allow a controlling and maybe Go back to sound or your hands and see if this movement can come and go just as it is. Without the judgment of controlling, just allow it and then move away to the place where it can come and go without the controlling. No problem. If you get lost in thinking in some way, you just notice it come back to wherever the breath is, maybe at the end of the end of the rising, the middle of the falling, it doesn't matter. And with whatever happens, Kindness, tenderness, care, joy, peace, sleepiness, restlessness, doubt, aversion, attachment. Excitement, grief, fear, loneliness, anger, enthusiasm, happiness. It's the same instruction. Finding that quality of awareness where we understand we don't have to fix or control or manipulate what's appearing. We just allow 
the experience to come and go by itself. Just as it is. Without the additional embellishment. That's based on past memory. with great care or tenderness or peace. With the aliveness of life itself.
Thank you, Michelle. Hmm. Something nice about just getting back to Vipassana practice. <clears throat> After all these weeks of the Brahma Viharas. Mm. About a, a month or so ago, I um, signed up for this program with the National Institutes of Health <clears throat> called all of us basically they're at, they're trying to get like a million people in the united states to volunteer like kind of all of their health and medical records and information for like the next 10 years and so um you know they want it to be sort of as vast a swath of the population and like social position and you know race ethnicity class Mm, childhood, you know, conditions of all kinds. So it's, um, you know, they're, they're ambitious and trying to kind of gather a bunch of data that's more representative, you know, of the population than some of what they have at this point. They, and you, you see you, you know, you're giving all your uh, medical records and, and your DNA, you know, uh, information and stuff like that. And so part of it is also uh, like they they sent me this little Fitbit. <laughs> Fitbit. This little thing, you know, many people obviously know what they are. You know, they track stuff on you, like your. Maybe show it again. Oh, Not everybody little, saw it. A little watch. <laughs> it's like a it's like a less fancy Apple Watch or something, right? I mean, they have ones that are Fitbits that are more fancy, but this one is like, uh, you know, measures your pulse, measures your breathing rate, um, has GPS and stuff like that. And, and can, based on like a few, whatever it can measure, <laughs> it has like all these things it can determine, you know, about how well you're sleeping and your, you know, cardiovascular fitness and exercise and et cetera, et cetera. Um, they want, they ask, they say really, you know, uh, to pro try to wear it at least four full days a month, you know, but they'd like people to wear it for a whole year, you know, so we'll see if I, I'm not really like a watch wearer most of the time, but it is, it is kind of interesting and it has, as one might expect, and maybe you have, people here have more experience with them than I do of like this mix of being like kind of oppressive and kind of um, motivating, you know, that sense of like, it's tracking everything, you know, and there's just that sense of like, oh, <laughs> a pressure that's there, you know, of like this consciousness of like, okay, it's all charted, you know, how much you move and how much you're whatever. Uh, and then there is the sense of like, oh, well, because of that, you're aware, or I'm more aware of, you know, how much I'm moving or exercising or walking or not. And so this sense of like, oh, it's easier to to track. And there's a little bit more of this kind of motivation to to like, you know, keep on top of stuff, you know, or you, you realize you can't really trust your own awareness of how much exercise you're getting necessarily in a single day or, you know, some of it, but You know, you're, what does Bobby Dylan say? You cannot depend on it to be your guide. It's you who must keep it satisfied. Watch your conscience. And so there's like a, whatever, an interesting kind of experiment. And you know, the, the psychology of it, they've probably studied these things. It's very, it's very like affirming, you know, of like you've reached this goal or you did this or, you don't have like, it's not like you're so lazy, <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing? You know, what's going on? So far, I haven't had that alert arrive. But it, it does make you feel sort of like a monkey, you know, too, right? Of just being like, we're, we're pretty basic in terms of uh, 
some of the like <laughs> like buttons that you can press in us to like make us do things you know or change behavior which is obviously so hard to do and i think that's what's gotten me sort of like so there's this value to it and it'll be interesting to see what that value is or how much of how much of that value ends up being for me or just sort of like it's recorded somewhere and there's meaning in it on some level but that sense i've had of like oh i wish it would be better there's data i'm more interested in <laughs> than like my heart rate you know uh though i have learned to value these things over the last few years mm, but like you know like it'd be good to be able to create some kind of like a karmic fitbit you know where it was really like measuring your deeds through the day and keeping track you know and giving you old <laughs> the old encouragement um because it's it's very hard to keep track of that you know it's another thing where it's like oh you maybe have a general sense that you're a good person or a general sense that you're a bad person or what have you but you realize like a lot of that self-referencing is is very conditioned and, and not necessarily based on anything objective and um you know that it would be kind of useful at times to have a little bit of like oh you know you did more good things today than bad things you know or like you only did one bad thing today but it was like really bad you know and it actually outweighed all of the little good things you did and there would be some you know algorithm algorithm for that you know how generous you were how aversive. And, and I think it's like that kind of thing where I'm suspicious of like measurability of any of these things in the first place. And of math in general. You know how it was like in school, if you, you got a good grade on a test and it kind of like bumped up your average a little bit. But if you got a bad grade, like your whole average would just crash somehow. You know, I mean, it never seemed like it was like even. I think there's it's skewed against us, the universe in that way. But really, you know, of course, this is what vipassana is on some level trying to be. I mean, it's it's a, it is a basic component and aspect of the practice is this sense of awareness of our actions, our deeds what we are creating in the world and in our own hearts and minds and our sense of responsibility for that and the kind of deepening sense of responsibility for that right the, the more the more refined the tool of awareness gets right to be able to see the details of a sense stimulation and the heart's response and then the whatever verbal, physical, or other mental gestures that come out of that response. Um, you know, these are things that we learn to observe, like, very clearly, you know, and, and very sequentially. And there's very much a, uh, see, it's, it's like, it is telling me, it's like, okay, you're sitting around too long. I can usually turn off the, <laughs> the notifications. <laughs> the sense of, like, um, sensitivity, you know, to our actions and to what's motivating them. And some ability to track that and to feel good about our good actions and to be remorseful of and even have a healthy fear of unwholesome action and, and the trouble it can cause ourselves or others in the world. Um, you know, there is a way that the practice is designed for this, you know, is designed to kind of help us be a, um, a, an observer, a more and more refined observer and um, empower, you know, of our kind of mental, emotional, karmic fitness, you know, um, of, of the mind and of our lives, the, the stream of our lives. And it's important to recognize that, you know, especially, you know, for folks coming out of retreat and, 
you know, the, the, there's something so powerful in the seclusion of the retreat where we're not, the emphasis on action is less, you know, and it's more in terms of like the refinement of the, of the tools of understanding and observation and cultivation of certain qualities. And then going, you know, kind of re-entering the world and coming back out into our daily lives, the sense of not feeling like we lose our practice or lose track of our practice just because we don't have the container and um, support of the concentration, you know, the seclusion. Because those are, can be very dramatic, you know, when those things kind of fall away and we're re-inundated with our responsibilities and just sort of stimuli in, in our lives. We lose that protection that there's a little more sense of like, ah, oh, okay, now now is like a, rather than easing up, where is there a sense of like, okay, no remembering and being more conscious of the fact that we need to try to be careful and observant of these these little moments, these chains of events between sensory stimuli, emotional response, and then physical, verbal gesture. Um, that determine so much about our lives, you know, and and the path that we're and the channel we're sort of cutting for ourselves. And where it's like, where are we moving toward more goodness, more you know, wholesomeness, more generosity, more kindness, more patience? Where are we trying to do you know less of? Uh, you know, harmful acts and, and recognizing the value of restraint also, right? That it's not just the doing of that, which is about the, the restraining from that, which might be harmful, you know, for ourselves or others. I often, you know, I post things on social media and, you know, it's not always like pleasant things. Sometimes there are painful things in the world and things that are upsetting, you know, that I want to, share or shed light on, particularly if there are things where I feel like other people might not be as aware of, you know, that I'm aware of in my world. And um, usually I really try to have it be, you know, the sense of it's informative and yes, it might be upsetting, but it's also like important to know, you know, and maybe it's inspiring to get engaged or do something about or etc. But yesterday I came across something that it just triggered me being very upset <laughs> and and i was like i really realized like i was i was about to like post it on facebook not to like out of general interest <laughs> but really out of anger and really with the intention of creating more anger right that like uh, to spread aversion right around you know the behavior of like these people and um boy it really it was very intense you know to <sighs> when we get triggered especially around like things that are like karmic knots for us you know like deep entanglements where we just don't see our motivation clearly and we can act recklessly and um it was it was very powerful to like <laughs> like don't do it <laughs> you know just like ooh, just wait 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 and like just this practice of like it's not about the object right it's this it's the pain is here right the frustration the anger the aversion the grief the whatever it might be is here and it's like rather than like wanting to spread it or wanting to you know make sure people are like punished for eternity for whatever behavior it's like ah uh, like feeling it you know, and it was like, I was like, if I had a karmic Fitbit, I would get like medals for not having done what I, what I didn't do, you know, it would be like buzzing and fireworks and, you know, so, though I still don't have such a device, I, I gave it to myself. <laughs> anyway, you know, my, my reassurance for, um, for not wanting to do that, you know, just like, it, it's like, and, and, to, and, to, and to have this clarity of like, oh, I really think 
that I, I understood a little bit more of like what I do want to be doing and what I don't. And wh what is the difference there, you know, around like, do I want to be contributing to the vitriol and the hatefulness and the, the toxicity of things and the, the mayhem, you know, or do I want to be contributing to the goodness? And, and not that the goodness always feels good, you know, I mean, there's things about, you know, that are good that are also not necessarily like pleasant all the time in terms of how we might contribute. But it felt very clear in that moment of like, oh, actually, no, I do not want to be, <laughs> I don't think I want to be contributing to the, to the vitriol, you know. And that with our practice, it's like actually with a moment, you know, you, you it's amazing that you, you, we can have so much power within a moment to just like, oh, not, not take the bait, you know, not um, buy into something, not further a momentum towards the badness, you know, for ourselves, for others. And, and I, I think it's like just important to remember that these are, this is a responsibility of ours, you know, in the, in the, the Buddha's framework, the, the sense that we are part, we are the inheritors of a stream of past action that's all unfolding in the present moment. And this kind of teaching around Kama has so much to do with our own past action and the sense that like whatever actions we do now, we will inherit, right, in the next moment or if through guilt or shame or, you know, in the more sort of mystical side of things in some future moment, you know, that there, there are consequences to all of our actions and that we ourselves are the inheritor of those things. And it's not part of the Buddhist teaching so much as the obvious, which is that we are also the inheritors of other people's past actions and other people are the inheritors of our past actions and that there is a, a social river that we are and, and a human and a river of existence that we are also recipients of, right? That, that we bear the burden of past action much beyond our only our own, right? That the way that it impacts our lives and the way of all of, you know, human history or of existence is kind of like built up to this moment right here. And that we are inheriting our share of that in this moment, right? The, the pleasant, the unpleasant, the neutral, and that in every moment we are also contributing. That we have this incredible responsibility and power and fragility of like how quick the moment is passing, you know, how fleeting it is, how overwhelming this sort of flood of inundation is. And then like that we have responsibility to be what we're contributing to the river as it continues. And just this, the, I think this sort of basic sense of, do we want to be contributing to the goodness or do we want to be contributing to the harm, right? The increased mayhem, the increased chaos and <sighs> hardship. Or do we want to be contributing to the the sort of sense of clarity, of kindness, of generosity, of patience, of that which is helpful, that which is supportive, that which is beautiful, you know, in the world, rather than the sort of toxic sludge, you know, that, that yes, is still being produced by elements of, you know, this mind and body system. You know, do we want to be just like pouring that into the common river that we're a part of. I grew up, there was a poster in my house, in our living room of Emiliano Zapata, the Mexican revolutionary, a peasant leader and it just said, in big letters, it was a very serious picture of him, in big letters, it just said, what are you doing to defend the conquest to which we give our lives? I also watched like Mr. Rogers and stuff too, so I had some balance of the uh, messages of 
responsibility and Sesame Street and all that too. But mm, there's something important about that sense of um, the magnitude of what we're a part of and what role do we want to play in the big unfolding and where we're contributing and where we're making things harder for ourselves or for other people. And there, There is a place for that kind of pressure, right? And sober kind of reflection, you know, about our lives, about our actions. And to know that we're, you know, it's like we're not always sure what, what role we play or what we're capable of. And that may change over our lives in terms of all kinds of factors, you know, that we have more capacity for or less capacity for and the sense of where are we contributing and or where at the very least are we not contributing to the toxicity, you know, to the harmfulness, to the hardship. And to be engaged in that which is beautiful, not only because it's right and righteous, but because it also, because it feels good. You know, that is a sort of other piece of this. It's like to be generous, you know, to create and to give away and to be kind and to be compassionate. That, these are actually strengthening things. You know, it's like, that's the the good side of this whole thing. It's like actually being good and being kind and being with the you know, kusala, wholesome, our actions, having, committing to wholesome action actually feels good, you know. There's a beauty to it, there's a purity, there's a strength, you know, that that we feel we benefit from and that is shared in that as well. How important that is to recognize and and to feel and to explore and to, to have it be moving and motivating to us, you know. Of course, you know, we also see that it's, it's purifying, you know, by that, I mean, it's like by, by trying to do good and, and, and be helpful and be kind and be generous, you know, that it's, um, it is going to evoke those kind of counter tendencies in the heart as well. If we're growing, right. If it is, if it is truly growing, you know, it doesn't, there, it's good to be kind and generous in ways that are comfortable for us, definitely. And then there's going to be times where it's like uncomfortable. The conditions aren't easy. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, and the, the, the determination to still be generous, right? To still create something and to offer it, you know, is um, harder than other times. And part of that is like we'll see then the the limitations of the natural impulse and and where do we respect that and are careful with like not overextending, but also where do we see and be honest about our these countervailing forces in the heart, you know where in our doing of good, are we really wanting affirmation and recognition? You know, where are we wanting payment or something in exchange? Where are we, you know, creating more of a sense of self that is um, solidifying a me versus dismantling the sense of me and mine and possessiveness, you know? It's not to say that, of course, of course we want recognition. Of course we want people to be thankful for whatever we may do and to be seen in, in our creativity and our gestures of kindness. And um, it's not that it's like a immoral need, but we also see that it's not the purest <laughs> uh, aspect of the act, right? That there is something very powerful about giving and not getting recognition and having the seeing how hard that is in the heart and bearing the hardness of that right creating something beautiful offering it to the world and having it not be seen right or feel like it's not valued 
Mm, you know, there's a, a the willingness to have that pain and to recognize it and to honor it and to know how hard it is and why we are addicted to recognition and self and meanness and, um, you know, not to pathologize it, but to understand the painfulness of it and little by little, you know, purify that process of what is it like to give away without needing the recognition, without needing anything in return. What does it mean to be creating a sense of self through what we're producing? Right. Because it's so important. I mean, it, it is something that I feel like I have learned so much in my life is the value of creating something beautiful and giving it away. Right. W creating it with the intention to give it away and giving it away, you know. And now we all have to, people have to make a living. It's not to say that by creating something and selling it, that that's like, again, that that's like unethical or something. Um, you know, we need to be able to support ourselves and, you know, plenty of people who's in our world whose labor has not been valued, right? And so the sense of um, needing the recognition, the sort of social validation of payment for work, um, if labor has been stolen, you know, from you or from your ancestors. And at the same time, noticing the difference in the heart, right? What does it feel like to, you know, bake a pie or knit something or create something, write a song, write a poem, you know, and, and give it, you know, something children often are encouraged to do in school and they write cards and they, you know, make things and, you know, learn these little thing, crafts, projects, you know, in classes and in school. And at some point it's not like so much encouraged, you know, it's not so, it's good. It's good to do, you know, whether you learn some weird thing to, during the COVID pandemic, you know, some new skill, <laughs> like to share it you know and to to feel like what that's like rather than making like a kind of cottage industry out of it which you could do too it's like it's fine i mean i know you know a lot of people have done things like that and there's something great you know wonderful to be able to have a livelihood based on something you don't hate you know and that you are the owner of the product of your labor it's very powerful mm, but you know, the sense of giving away something that you've cared for, that you've created, that you've cultivated, how beautiful that is. And, and this sense of where where is labor that doesn't create a monetary value, right? That doesn't create um, a, a distance between people that doesn't even, can't be exchanged, right? But that actually is a kind of, that giving that dismantles ownership, that unhooks us from the kind of burdens of self and meanness and mindness. You know, how good it is to, to find something or things that we can give away. and deal with the repercussions of of having them not be valued if they're if you don't feel like they are and resentment in the heart and the antagonism there it's like these are hard things but they're they're important it's like it's the purification is so powerful and what good fortune if they are valued right and, and there is reciprocation and there is honoring and there is that sense of human connection that happens in it how beautiful you know, so it's good either way. And there's an easy way and there's a hard way, of course. And I, I think the thing I, I want to say most, just like to, to, to finalize about that, is that the the it's a place where um, a little method can be helpful. 
right? When we're triggered by a kind act that hasn't been kind of, uh, that we don't feel like has been reciprocated or acknowledged or we have this sort of pain, it's really important to see, and this is for everything, but like Michelle's R-A-I-N um, schema, you know, RAIN, like it's such a powerful place to to be able to attend to these wounds and these pains and these contractions of the heart without judgment, right? Without self-blame or self-hatred, but also to stop the chain of events that would otherwise flow forward in that river, right? So the sense of recognition, acceptance, interest, non-identification, you know, when this, when something happens and there's this clenching, this contraction in the heart, right? When we're vulnerable because of something we've sort of opened or offered or exposed in our hearts and this kind of, when we do that, you know, as Michelle will say often, it's like we open our hearts to everything, right? It's not just to the pleasant. We open our hearts to the full range of experience and our vulnerabilities in particular. So, you know, sometimes it's like whether or not someone has been thankful or has affirmed us, we also see that there's like a hole in the heart that will never be filled by enough recognition. There will never be enough affirmation or gratitude to fill the wanting that's in here around this sense of loss and, and invalidation and, and not insufficiency, right? And so this sense of where do we slowly realize that the goodness doesn't have, isn't coming from a place that that's identified that in that negative way, right? Or in that wanting way, that the goodness fills something regardless of whether it's affirmed or not. But that when that happens, when that kind of triggering happens, it's like, oh, recognizing it, accepting it as the truth, right? As this is what has happened, this is the mind's response. Being interested in it, oh, there's a wound. Can I care for it? Do I understand why? Oh, can I kind of be that sense of there's the interest of investigation that's more Vipassana quality or psychological or just caring, right, in a compassionate way for the a pain in the heart. And then the sense of non-identification, oh, the conditioned, it's conditioned, it's understandable, this is not me or mine, you know, just as what was offered five minutes ago was not me or mine. And it's so important to be able to make sure that these moments are, are actually purifying <laughs> versus just leading us down the path of pouring more sludge into the river that's unfolding, you know. And so I just, finally, I just want to say that there is this, um, there is a way that where it's like, contribute goodness, careful about contributing badness. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a little like, um, two-dimensional, you know, it's a little bit like um, ones and zeros. And um, and when it's like that, when it's like the good and the bad and what they're kind of balancing back and forth, it's always going to have that flavor of samsara, right? The ups and the downs and the more and the less and the good and the bad and the gain and the loss and the pleasure and the pain and all of this like uh, the ups and downs. And that this is the part of the power of the Vipassana practice and, and of the approach, which is like, it's not just about the doing more good or the doing less of harm, uh, but it is also about the place of pulling back and, and understanding that the need to contribute, the need to create, the need to, to, to manifest actions that are one way or the other part of this flow of experience is also, a, it is very hard to not have that tied to like samsara and the, the promulgation of these cycles of, you know, joy and sorrow in the world 
and in our lives. And so to know that like it is also considered wholesome, kusala, but it is different to sit back and close the eyes and observe, right? Where we're not just trying to generate the positive or just trying to keep the negative at bay, but we're trying to observe, right? We're, there's a, there's a, the mode of the practice that's fundamental that is about watching the way in which all volitional action has a quality of either greed, hatred, or delusion in it, right? As long as, until we are fully enlightened, there is going to be some attachment, some identification, some something we're not seeing that is manipulating and and influencing the results of the action enough to create whatever flow is created, but also to create ourselves in the sense of me and mine, right? That there is a way in which all of this volitional activity in the mind, heart, and then the way it spills out into our speech and into our physical actions and gestures is also kama, right? It is creating meanness on some level. And the the bhavana practice of watching this, of settling back of like actually not contributing, right? Not contributing to the, you know, either aspect of the flow of what's moving forward, but simply trying to observe it, to try to understand it, to try to, um, through and through the understanding, through the kind, tender, caring understanding, start to let it unravel, right? Start to let it unhook, so that this process of becoming, of the the, the assertion of meanness and myself into the next moment of who I'm going to be as I do this thing, or in the future, or some future notion of ourselves that we're sort of like casting out into the future and kind of pulling ourselves toward toward that that is a piece of this that we let go of, right? That we actually stop entirely, right? The contributing to the flow, to the river of goodness and badness and observe and unhook the mind from all of the identification associated with that. You know, it's said that, of course, fully enlightened beings are are incapable of killing, right? That they are, their their gestures are inherently kind and compassionate. But this idea that they're not generating future results, they're not generating future karma for themselves, they're not generating future existence for themselves, good or bad, is important. It's mysterious. It's um, maybe not helpful always, but there's times where it's it's meaningful to look at like what is that what is that like when we're meditating when we're sitting in our practice. Where, where the mind is that relaxed and that unhooked and that unneeding to have things go one way or another? Do we get a taste of that purity of mind that actually um, cuts the stream, is what they say in the tradition. And then we understand something about why, how you can measure the goodness and measure the badness and you like measure your heart rate and measure all these things and that there is something about the liberated mind that is immeasurable right the brahma viharas they're talked about as the immeasurables the the freedom of nibbana right um is an immeasurable you know an undescribable um reality and what a relief right that there is something beyond the little graphs of goodness and badness, of achievement and failure, and something that the heart longs for and can attain. So thank you for your kind attention. And we have um, some time for questions if anyone has any questions about your practice, about the instructions, any of the offerings. For us, the easiest way to know if you have a question is if on the little reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen there, there's a um, little thing that says raise hand. 
amidst the other reactions you could have. And if you raise your hand, we'll know that you have a question to ask. And if you can't find that, you can write just into the chat just that you have a question and we'll call on you. I will put this in here. If anyone else is interested in this all of us thing, you can check it out. Give away all your details to the government. Hi, Angela. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Michelle. Um, thank you for the meditation and the talk. It was beautiful. Hi, Angela. I had a question. Um, a on a retreat last year, I remember at the end, um, you talked, you and Steve maybe talked a little bit about how you can offer the merit accumulated to people who've died as a way of um, helping them on their journey. And I was just, I had someone re pass away recently, suddenly, and I wanted to, uh, I was thinking I could, you know, just as a way to think about them or not think about them, but just dedicate my practice to them for a month or, a time and I was just wondering if you could give some instructions about that or talk a little bit more um, about that. I remember you, you recounted the story of the, the nuns who, who would come out at night in Burma and I think they would say, is, was it Amye? Amye? Amya, Amya, <laughs> they scream it. Amya, Amya, take it, take it, take the, take Take the merit, take yeah. it. They scream it for a long time. It's very powerful. So you could try that one. <laughs> it's that. I guess I'd say it's that enthusiastic in, in the understanding of how, um, how much there's this just very genuine, pure wish to have as, you know, it's perfect for Jesse's talk. It's like for having the um, understanding that our, anyone's goodness, our goodness isn't ours. It's like a deep understanding of anatta that it's not ours and that the goodness of our action can be shared. And particularly um, when someone dies or with someone who is dead, that, um, that, that that has a power of helping them. Because, of course, we can share it. <laughs> So I think I think um, you know when when we're aware of of just um, like the practice of sila, for example, not non harming any time where we have refrained from killing or have refrained from or protect life, haven't haven't taken something that isn't given, 
protecting property, you know, have it, haven't harmed with our sexual energy, um, protecting relationships, right? Um, refrain from saying something unskillful that would be harmful or lying. Um, and, the, and of course, anytime we've harmed ourselves or others by um, our carelessness with drugs and alcohol, I think that um, there's a, just that one whole area of any, you don't have to like think of it as a big thing, but just one thing you think of that um, on that level or the paramis, you know, the practice again of, uh, you know, just any kindness we've expressed, or, you know, as Jesse's saying, like, it's, it doesn't have to be everything. It's just one, one way that we have been um, not harming, or the cause of even um, the cause of somebody's liberation. <laughs> you know, there's lots of levels to this, something we might say, or the way we are that might just be silent. So that that it's it's a very powerful practice. And I think it's particularly just to add into that, that um, one of the, the Buddha taught that the proximate cause for the appearance of metta, of loving kindness, is reflecting on um, beautiful qualities. The, our beautiful qualities or others' beautiful qualities. That's a, that's the proximate cause for the appearance of this loving kindness. Um, t- and so, one of the practices that are is meant to be done while we're still alive through our life is to remember, remember, um, like the, the our our good actions, good, that good is such a difficult word, but non-harming actions that before, for example, before we go to sleep, it's a great practice to do that because um, it's meant to be that before we die, that we're good at that. (laughs) That like, it's not suddenly like before we die, we're like, somebody tells us it's good to do, like, you know, and that it would be helpful for our death. it's also good to do for somebody else as they're dying is to like remind them of their positive qualities, their good actions. It's like very important. Um, and so, Angela, the long, it's a long answer, but it's just like it's, I'm answering it from different angles because it's meant to be enthusiastic. Like it's like the, the, the level to which the nuns chant it is meant to be how we can learn to be enthusiastic about um, our own goodness and sharing it. It's, I don't know, it makes me giggle and laugh because I think it's not, it's so not um, the modern culture. And and so a lot of it will have, be, have the degree to which we understand what the mind is and what the heart is and what, um, not being motivated by fear, not being motivated by anger, right? Or attachment that as we understand these things, the deeper the understanding, the deeper um, the sharing of merit is. And it's a wonderful thing to offer. It's an offering to someone who you care about. That no matter where, where, what lifetime they're in, um, that you know that it reaches them and helps them on their way. Thank you. On a technical level, would you just like have that intention to keep the person or, or just sit with that? There's definitely, uh, you know, one, one of the ways that's part of what you kind of mentioned right in the beginning, Angela, was like you can just, you know, sit. And then at the end of your sitting, you kind of dedicate the 
the merit of it, the punya, um, to this person, you know, or it could be just at the end of your day, you know, like whatever good deeds that I've accrued from my day to day, you know, may they, may they go to help, you know, to benefit this person, you know, on their journey, something like that. Um, so I think there's something about kind of doing it in smaller increments that can be helpful in terms of just a single sitting or at the end of a day. And I think there is a value of like, you know, there can be a value in what you said of like picking a period of time, you know, doing it for a week or doing it for a month. Um, I think that's, there's, there's something about that where it's like, okay, it's just, it's set, you know, you're doing it and it's sort of a ceremony, you know, that you're just bringing in and, and maybe at the end of the week you decide, oh, you want to keep going. The other side of it is, is like, you know, more, sometimes when someone dies, you do have more of a sense of connection with them for some period of time, you know, the, understanding that like the mind and the body are not necessarily, the mind is not necessarily located ever where the physical body is located. And so that that is like, those things don't need to necessarily have anything to do with your sense of like connection to a person. So it could be that for some period of time, you have more of a natural sense of connection with them, you know, and that won't be dictated by, of course, your sense of a week or a month. Um, and it may dissipate, it may kind of come and go, but to know that, that if, if there is a sense of that kind of feeling quality of their presence or just like a sense of connection with them in that time, that, you know, that can be something that's more of a practice, right? So there's a sense of just like doing whatever practice, meditation or your daily good deeds and offering the goodness of that, you know, to this other person on their journey. Then there's more kind of like what Michelle said of like, you know, kind of attuning to the person and, you know, again, there's a range. There is a sense of like offering of your own goodness and this, you know, on this question of like, is it my goodness or is it just sort of goodness that you have some ability to kind of like move in a certain direction? I think there's also sometimes a value in not needing to necessarily believe anything in particular about, I'll say for myself, there's a long time where I felt more conflicted about, well, if comma, if like we are the owners of our actions, which is like the baseline, right? For the, the language of how we talk about comma, then how is it that we can share our actions, like share the results of our actions? Like, does that not feel like some degree of kind of conflict within the tradition or whatever? So. I just don't really worry about it <laughs> anymore. And I think part of it is just getting that like, kind of one of the ways that Michelle described that I feel like is really valuable is just like in your sense of connection with them, recognizing that their lives, you know, they had, there, there, there was the momentum of generosity that they received and that they contributed towards. There was, you know, some degree of whatever, I think the paramis are a good place to start, you know, of like these kind of like wholesome, beautiful qualities and to go down the list and be like, oh, this person had this and this person received this and gave it and, and this sort of recognition of that goodness and perhaps of wherever we might have fit into that kind of flow of goodness um, is something that has a, a power and a value in the acknowledgement of, because, I do believe that, you know, there, any of us can lose track of our own goodness and to be reminded of it, especially in times that are confusing or disorienting or scary or doubtful, like at death or after death and, um, uh, is, can be very important, you know, so I think it's a good thing to do. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That, that, all this, that's really helpful because I just, also been having a lot of guilt that I didn't keep up as much with this person and um, I've been focused on that a lot this week um, yeah and I think in that in that light that clearly there's a sense of um 
recognizing that we're not always in touch with timelessness but that there that that like even in what you said it's like um it when we get caught up in stuff it's like we're not always connected to uh, timelessness but that doesn't mean it isn't real or that it isn't always there and and so often Sharing merit is a kind of leap of faith because we're not always in touch with timelessness. But but it's it's this it's the sense that um, whether we're alive or you know like and it was like five years you didn't think of somebody. It doesn't mean that in thinking of them in the present that you're accessing timelessness and that that um, is important. I don't know how else to say it. And I, I think that. Um, when when we try to explain this, uh, one of the things I think about is in the in the f- places that I have been in Burma that I know that a fully enlightened being has died, for example, there there is such a vibe of <laughs> goodness, like, <laughs> It's so powerful. It hits you in the head. Like it hits you. It just hits you. And it's like, um, I know just before Deepama died, she told me, I, I'll always be with you. You know, and so, you know, <laughs> I could, I thought she was pretty like wise. Like, why would I doubt her telling me that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, okay, well, maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> You know, like it, it would be ridiculous. Like it, she, she was the, the wisest person that I ever was around. So, like sometimes there is that kind of like leap of faith that, um, or a sus- they call it suspension of disbelief. But there is a level where just because we're not in that wavelength or that that timeless reality which is, meant, is said to be the, the truest reality. Timeless is the truest reality. The, and uh, getting caught in time is not considered tr- the truest reality. Then um, the practice of sharing the merit is a really good practice for just um, remembering timelessness in and of itself. And it, it heals a lot of the guilt of not being in timelessness. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Can you hear me? Okay, it worked. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to Angela's excellent question, if I could. I had some experience with that a couple years ago. Is this a question, know. Matt? I just want it... It's not, and if, that, if this isn't the place for it, that's okay, I can pass. Yeah, I think it's not actually. Yeah, okay. just to keep the container and sort of focused on the Got the it. dynamic. Yeah, thank you.
I think I, I do want to just say that, you know, it's like a, we've realized that we're in an interesting time in terms of this kind of online sangha and the reality of our kind of what is the, the nature of this like formation, you know, that comes together and falls apart and comes together and there's this sort of routine and this beauty of it and it's amazing. And I think we're, you know, just even a couple of years into it, trying to understand like what's the, what are the boundaries and what are the kind of appropriate um, structures and forms, you know, that we hold in order to kind of keep a sense of the continuity of the teachings and the coherence of what we're offering, the safety of everyone, the sense of protection. And, um, and at the same time, understanding that there is like more to community than just like teachers teaching and not quite sure, you know, where, what role, <laughs> what the future may or may not have in store for was that sort of level of like want people wanting, you know, like more engagement and more conversation and more sort of sense of connection with one another. Um, I think that we also recognize the, the peculiar and particular value of this type of container, which is not that social, but safe in many ways, not in every way, of course. Um, and that without some degree of sort of formality and sort of structure to that that there's a lack of an ability to to offer what's the kind of fundamental piece of what we're doing here in terms of the teachings um and that being said it's like yeah what other and, and what is our capacity as a organization and a teaching team in terms of like being able to manage other kinds of interaction and um community dynamics, um, something we're still certainly thinking about. So just, I just want to say that in the sense of like, where there's times where we might, it might feel like we hold a sort of strong boundary around certain kinds of like interaction and, um, and that that's why, is that we're just at this point kind of trying to be as careful as we can with the kind of nature of the dynamic that we're responsible for and the integrity of the teachings that we feel responsible for. Yeah, so the intention is safety, <laughs> protection, you know, that's the, that's the intention, which is a good intention. Um, but it's, there's nothing perfect about some structures. <laughs> it's like during the online retreats, we, we're very careful about reminding t people to be very careful about what they even ask, right? So it's um, it's that sense of um, <laughs> uh, care. It's, a, it's out of deep care. And we can't, you know, we can't do it perfectly, so. Well, if we were at church, we'd have coffee hour now, but we, <laughs> <laughs> you may all go enjoy a cup of coffee. Where are you? <laughs> this is my tea. <laughs> I know it's a little late for some folks, but mm. what well, wonderful again to see you all this weekend and we hope you're doing well, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday again. Um, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> take it, take it, take it. <laughs> it's all you have to say, um, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs>